Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. This episode from the meeting room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org. Porch Light Rental and Destination Services. Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs. Visit them at porchlightrental.com. And by Airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design and manage your international relocation. Find us at Airs.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by International Auto Source. We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. Become a global player in your field. Cross Culture To Go provides virtual support for your global business and career success. We can help you thrive in 140 plus countries and markets. On the web at crossculturetogo.com. It's Ed Cohen again in San Diego, and you're on Global TV Talk Show. And here we are in Chicago with Diane Devitt, uh, a media expert and co-author of a book. Hold up that book again, please. Yeah, sure. Called to Lead. 18 authors, women? 18, yes. Me and 17 of my closest friends. <laughs> so did you organize all that? No, oh, actually, uh, a colleague and a friend, her name is Pegine, uh, Pegine Chavaria. She she has a mastermind. We're all part of it. And so we all, those of us who were uh, called to participate in different areas. So each chapter, I'm the creative leader. Someone's inspir- you know, someone is the um, methodical leader. Everyone has a different adjective before their leadership chapter, chapter but it's all driven to help young women and, and women in business with success strategies of what advice can we give you after and we've doing it? So the, uh, Stephen uh, and I met about a year ago uh, and uh, then we decided to do programs together, but uh, he's also talked about his books uh, and he's working on number 22 um, and, uh, but the 21 and beyond and, beyond so Stephen, why don't you tell us and diane in particular about uh caliente leadership oh all right thanks ed so uh, good to meet you diane the uh, caliente yeah. leadership is at my company in southern california we do leadership facilitation leadership coaching have some online programs for leaders um and the name is interesting because uh those who know spanish know caliente hot. means hot but <laughs> This is the beauty of it, Diane, is, is the second definition of caliente is passionate. And um, a, co- a conversation caliente is a passionate conversation. So I'm passionate about leadership. And also where I live in California is uh, the land is owned by the Agua Caliente Band of Indians. So it's uh, hot water. So and uh, so it's my, my tribute to our Native American landowners as well. So it's uh, kind of, and it gives me my little elevator speech. <laughs> People, what does your name mean? So, uh, so so what color would you call us? Red. Red. Hot. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so many books all about turning managers into great leaders, but not everybody can make that leap, right? Steve? No, no, not at all. Uh, and a lot of people don't want to. And, and sometimes when I'm co- in coaching people, um, I say to them, I said, look, you know, biggest mistake you can make, you can take a guy, you know, a guy or a lady who's a great car salesman, for instance, and they are a great salesperson in any industry. And then he's OK, you're, you're so good. You're now the sales leader. They only know how to motivate themselves. Um, and that's often the people I, I coach is because they don't they don't have to motivate other people. They don't know how to teach people how to sell. They some, sometimes they have natural sales skills. So people who are really good individual contributors. Uh, don't necessarily make great leaders, um, and they but unfortunately they get thrown in the deep end uh, by many organizations. And uh, so, one of the things I do is help help them understand that if there's a difference between leading yourself and, and leading people. Mm-hmm. 
So you, you also help people write books. I do. I do. That's uh, what was interesting. What was a sideline hobby, just just kind of fun, helping some people. Oh, I want to write a book. And so I said, OK, well, I'll help you. Um, and I only work with people writing nonfiction books during the pandemic. This has turned into a business. <laughs> and during the pandemic, I've helped. Uh, so in the last 18 months, I've helped three authors publish six books altogether um, wow. and uh, bring their books to marketplace. So uh, it's, it's a passion also. And that, by the way, that one's called Caliente Press. So the same thing. It's passion. I only work with passionate authors. <laughs> So, yeah, so I, I don't want my color is Diane, but I guess it has to do something with passion. Oh, it does. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Broadway is reopening. Are you excited about that? I am. You know, I am. Listen, my first love is theater, right? And uh, theater is so connected to events and and getting people back together. And, and I think the actors are thrilled to be back on the stage. And uh, yeah, so it's exciting. It's exciting for all of us to get that infusion of art back live, isn't it? Yeah, that that would be good to go. Those theaters, most of them are so crowded. I mean, so yeah, I don't know how. I don't know. Other. Yeah, I don't know exactly how they're doing that, Ed. I mean, I I think um, you know that's something I'm not privy to. I I heard different variations that people were alternating rows, you know. Um, but I really I really don't know. I'm just. I'm just excited at the opportunity. I'm just excited to hear that they're back. Yeah. You know? So are, are you doing NYU uh, virtual? Uh, yes, NYU. And I'm also I'm also launching my own course in the industry in about two weeks um, in addition to that. And I uh, have a creativity inspirational workshop that I'll be launching next month. So I'm working on a couple of things. That sounds, that sounds interesting. Can you tell us more about that? About- the, the workshop, the creativity yeah. workshop? Well, it, it's, 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 you know, it's my belief that many people don't truly grasp the meaning of being creative. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always the people with the purple hair and doing something out there. When I tell people my accountant is the most creative person in my <laughs> life. That man has that man has worked miracles over the past few years. <laughs> don't don't, don't tell the don't tell the IRS that. <laughs> oh no, I know, but he's you know everything's legit, everything's legit. But it's just the, but the, but it's his logic, and yeah. you know at its very core. And I always refer to you know when I wrote my book, and Ed referred to the color, but the book was the book name this is a few years, was is called What Color Is Your Event, mm-hmm. and the point is that that can be applied to anyone is that inspiration to name that book came from a, an event that I produced for a C-suite level. I said, how am I going to communicate with 99 men and, and one woman, all business, all manage, right, all executives, global executives. And I had to find a commonality. And so that commonality was using color as the uh, tool in the event so that with every um, interstitial with every break with every meal there was a different color and this was which I forgot the most important thing to tell you is this was an a major engineering company the CEO and the number two said to me I don't care how you do it but change the way of thinking from these left brain engineers Mm -hmm. And that's what the incentive, that's what the inspiration was. That's how that came about. So color was used as as a tool and then an analogy. And then it became an interest of mine and delving more into sensory work and the neuroscience of it all. So I know I was kind of a long answer, but I hope it it helped a little bit. Yeah. Would it, could a leader read your book? So here's the thought that crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. Could a leader read your book and apply it to the workplace? So for instance, what color is your meeting? What colors your week? Um, exactly, sort of exactly. So to get back to the question on on the creative workshop and the innovation, which I was inspired by the book, is exactly that point, Stephen. Is it takes me when I've done these two day workshops or these seven week workshops, it takes a while for me to reach that light bulb in your brain. Mm-hmm where you have the courage to believe what you're thinking 
And, and that, you know, that ability to trust that little voice in your head when you may not understand it and take action on it is truly what I, I, I want to get people to that point of. Now, in business, that takes another dimension of thinking because if you're my, my boss and you're in the same room as me and Ed presents a, a situation, but I see the answer and clearly maybe you don't, do I have the creative confidence do I have the courage to share that? And, and so I teach people how to go about that um, without the fear, the fear and the intimidation that sometimes comes in that kind of an environment. Nice. nice. But it all ties into a creative workshop. And, and at its core, in, at its core, creativity is the ability to solve a, a problem. Solve problems or create new ideas, right? I mean, to create new ideas and... Yes, and to and to just like I say, come up with a solution. So mm-hmm. that's that's what I try to impart on people. So um, before we get into inspiration, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk about um, uh, creativity within an engineering environment. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll tell you why I just said that. Uh, about a month ago or so, I had uh, a show with. Uh, <clears throat> two uh, former executives since retired from Boeing in Seattle, uh, which is, of course, ultimate engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, one guy uh, was a salesman, all right? Uh, And he he sold jets to countries uh, around the world, (laughs) okay? Um, And then the other guy was a cross-cultural trainer, all right? So... The question for George, the trainer, cross-cultural guy, who's kind of a professorial, now white hair, white beard, um, do-gooder idea, okay, of a guy. Uh, how does he work with engineers <laughs> who are who are not that way at all, for the most part? And so, how do you create in an engineering environment where everything has to flow. And so what you were just saying, cue that up in my head. So how would you use the color and the creativity approach to satisfy that CEO of an engineering group? Well, it's interesting that you brought up Boeing um, because I often share a story when I'm teaching this or when I'm doing this training. And, And you do know the man in my life is an engineer for 35, no. 40 years. Yes. And no for idea. whatever reason, the universe uh, did this. Most of my clients in my active event production days were engineers. So, you know, I think it was more torture for them than me, but that's beside <laughs> the point. <laughs> um, but this is a, this is a, it is a very interesting story that I share. And I read this years ago and it is, it's, it's timeless. All right. That there was a, the CEO of Boeing was giving potential new customers a tour of their facility, you know, where they build the, the planes and the whole, the whole thing. Um, and they approached a mechanic who worked at the Boeing for 30 some odd years. And his job was to rivet the, rivet the, the planes. Same task every day. All right. This man did it. But They went to him specifically because he just had certain qualities about him. And when the CEO asked him, they say, you know, someone's, I'll just say, John, you know, John, can you say hi to our potential? Can you explain to them what you do? And he said to them, I bring people together every day. I reunite people. So he didn't look at his job as I'm a riveter and lunches at 12 o'clock and same old thing every day he saw another dimension of what the result of his job does and his participating in it. And I will never forget that story. And so when you have someone who deals with cross culture, which is of course the whole globalization of something and trying to understand different people, how different people think. Listen, I have to try to understand how my mic thinks 
every day <laughs> because it's so different. I, in my brain, say, this is really a good, tra- this is the best training in the world for me, honey. What? <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, salespeople might adapt more to, more to um, a personality um, or maybe not. So I think that, you know, when, when you think about what do you really do, what do you really bring to people, who are the people that you're working with, how do they think? I mean, Stephen, this has to be your work, right? This has to be your work, too. I mean, it's so, right? It's so intertwined, right? Yeah, it is. And one of my books is about decision making. And in the book, I talk particularly about stress and how we get emotionally hijacked and, and what happens physiologically, what happens in the brain and, and you know, the fact that it secretes cortisol when you're getting emotionally hijacked and, and why you make bad decisions, and, and particularly as a leader, but as anybody, just as a human being. Um, the, um, do, you, do, you, um, do you get into discussions with your groups about you know, the old brain, the, the new brain, the middle brain, or you know, talk about that kind of stuff too? At some time, you know, yeah. to the best of my neuroscience ability, I mm-hmm. definitely talk about that little amygdala mm-hmm. and how it can hijack us and how we can get up in the morning with such certainty, like I am going to be on the Ed Cohen show. <laughs> and then five minutes ago, I might be, you know, crying in the bathroom. Um, because I've completely lost that confidence, which, you know, we'll make a note of, of how confidence is the cousin of inspiration mm-hmm. and creativity is the, is the product of it. So, so it's all, uh, it's very interesting, you know, and is it the brain or is it something more powerful at work and understanding what's more powerful at work, at work, so, I should say, so- not at work. <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, you posted a thing on LinkedIn. Uh, by the way, it's a beautiful photography of you. Uh, you. And, and um, the lighting was perfect and the green trees, wherever you were. So, uh, but you were talking about uh, the artist and inspiration. Jackson Pollock. So uh, I don't have the video with me, mm-hmm. but what, why don't you just talk about how this relates? Well, what, what happened was, and, I, I, and the video that I made was, listen, you make videos of truth nowadays, but it's authentic. I, I couldn't sleep one night, and I was just given a book on Jackson Pollock, which is actually on the, uh, my desk right here. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I believe, you know, one of the, one of the lines is it, in it was how, um, how our best work comes out in uncertainty and how we're inspired by um, darkness sometimes. You know, I say darkness for lack of a better word, wherever that place is. Um, and anyway, I, I, I interestingly, had, I also wrote an article on loss and how when, especially nowadays, there isn't anyone I know who hasn't lost something in this transformation that we're in. Uh, you know, parents, yes, and obviously by deaths and passing and jobs and, and familiarity. So, so many forms of it. But what, where inspiration comes in, in that is people have been inspired by, if I take this away from you, what do you have left? And what can you do with what's left? And so I think that there's also been such a, a resurgence towards what's next in business. I mean, you've, you've all, you've both seen it. I mean, there's so many wonderful ideas coming out of now and, and I don't think they're here yet, but I think they're definitely works in progress of people learning to work with the new tools that were given. So that, you know, that whole thing of getting up there and yes, I thought, you know what? Yes, we all need to work with what we have. And that's the message that's being told right now. Brilliant. So Stephen, I think it's time for you to, uh, introduce the uh, Thrive and Strive XL uh, idea that you had originally uh, about uh, how, uh, what it is. And then let's see if we can tie Diane to that too. All right. Thank you. So 
we came with this idea for two shows. Uh, the Thrive XL show was all about how leaders can create workplace wellness and and the, and the leadership well-being for themselves as well, and walk the talk of, of wellness. And and of course, wellness incorporates psychological safety and mental health. And you know, it's not it's just not uh, you know preventing shootings at the office sort of a wellness thing. But and then the other one is Strive XL, and that's our focus is on how leaders can strive to be better leaders, how they can strive to build their teams and develop their people and just strive to be better human beings, basically. And, you know, I'll admit the original idea was, was called Strive X and Thrive X. And, um, but there, there was a pharmaceutical company in Florida, I think called Thrive X or something. Yeah, I was going to say, play, it sounds like a health drink. <laughs> yeah. We, we were going to play off this, you know, the, the SpaceX and the TEDx and what, but then I thought, you know what, put an L there and we want people to live extra large. So that's, so these are, so these are programs where we want people to thrive and strive and, and live extra large, large lives. And I think, uh, you know, Diane's a good, good example of that from what I've uh, heard so far of, of her background and what she's doing. And like you said, you take, you take what you have and you work with it and you, you excel it, you, you make, you make it better. You, and you, you know, you use creativity. And so that's where we're at. And these shows are just about having an engaging conversation. And so what I'd like to do is, is, asked Diane to kind of elaborate on something she just talked about because it's really interesting because you said that creativity comes out of uncertainty or I guess you said I would think ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? And and I think for most leaders, uncertain for most people, uncertainty is is fearful. I mean, as human beings, psychologically, we want certainty. That's a, you know, a psychological thing that we want. Um, so how can uncertainty and ambiguity, how does that drive creativity? Well, I, I think when we're in that place, which we collectively are <laughs> in an <laughs> ambiguous place. And will be for years, it looks and will, like. <laughs> and will be, for, yes, for, we will be for, for quite a while, right? Mm-hmm. But when aren't we? And when aren't you? Like, isn't, isn't it sort of an oxymoron that we sometimes go around thinking that we're so in control and that we can manage ourselves? Or others that we can manage. Our... <laughs> or others, like, and they're in business. Oh, I've got everything under control and I've got this plan and I've got that plan. Well, you know, I am a, an extremely spiritual person. And, and for those of us who share that vision and that um, openness, and that ability. I mean, this is a time where, you know, to your point is, what is ambiguity? Ambiguity, and as you, as you said, Stephen, is very fearful for people. I was reading a, a paper done by EY, um, and I don't know if I've tended to you, like the CEOs, you know, what they're responding, they're really concerned with, it's just as you hit the nail on the head here, is, is wellness, mental well-being, um, camaraderie, getting people back to the office in a safe getting them productive again, right? Um, Trusting that. But at its basic core, ambiguity is a bridge from where we were to where we're going, right? It's, it's, It's right in that same playing field as chaos. It could be chaos. So am I, um, am I ambiguous on something which I don't understand? And am I making the choice to go down that road of chaos and confusion and no action and paralyzing myself into the point of ineffectiveness? Or am I saying, okay, ambiguity, I'm going to use you to try something new. I'm going to experiment. You know, um, for many years, I worked with MIT as a client, as a customer, and there is no, there is nothing that's considered failure. I took that away with me for many years. They actually look to make what we would call errors or mistakes. Oh, but that's not how you refer to it. Oh, that didn't work. So let's go on to plan B and plan C and plan D until we can get that, sh- that rocket up into space. Okay. Because we know what didn't work. So, so the question is, do you have faith in a higher power? And that's what I would sock to anybody. Like the safety net, the direction you can take, 
the mindfulness, you know, all the billions of dollars that are spent on, on mindfulness and wellness and all of the books that are written about things boil down to, do you have faith? And truly, if you have faith, and, I, and I'm not getting off on any tangent here, but faith in a higher power or someone, is it helps you to come to realize that, right, control is an oxymoron. Should you have a plan? Absolutely. Should you take action? No question. But when that comes to you, and when the results come to you, might be two years from now, might be a year and a half. Um, Stephen, you're in SoCal. I just came back from Irvine. And for many years, uh, for a few years, my girlfriend lived in the Tustin area. And she used to point up a hill and say, I want to live up there. Um, Turtle Park or Turtle, whatever it's called. Anyway, um, guess where she lives now? You know, now this was five years later. So it's about, and, and five tumultuous years later. Uh, and I always said to her, you don't have the answers because they're not, it's not time yet. And I, I think, and, and Ed, this of course is inspiration and all of that, um, is that we are part of a bigger picture. It's important that we have a plan. It's important we do something. Now, getting back to earth <laughs> and how you deal with jo Joe Blow and you know John Smith in, in, in the corporate setting is we make plans, we take action on them, and then we make plan B and C. And we trust that if this doesn't work, that we can fall back on others. Well, Diane, I think you're delivering a commencement address here. This is just that. Uh... <laughs> we interrupt this broadcast to bring you a timely announcement. Hi, I'm Sergei Gorbatov. I'm Angela Lane. Together we are researchers, writers and practitioners in the field of human resources. And we've also been multi-country, multi-assignment career expats. We owe our professional development and growth to a very large extent to the international assignment opportunities that we have had. But in a world where distributed work may become the norm, we also want to understand what happened to the nature, duration and purpose of international assignments. Together with our colleague, Julian Delzell from the University of South Carolina, we're undertaking a study on the future of expatriation. And we'd value your contribution. You can participate in this important study by completing a simple 10 minute questionnaire. Access the questionnaire by typing in your browser tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. That's tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. You can also find the link here on Ed's website next to this video. Thank you for joining us in this study. In return for your contribution, we'll provide you with a copy of our research. And of course, you'll be invited to an exclusive webinar hosted by Ed, where we will share our findings right here on Global Business News. And so please go to tinyurl.com forward slash expat study. Take the survey so that we can better understand the future of expatriation. Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're 
attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this great flexibility. And for the program owners of these sports leagues, it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. You know, the, there was something in, uh, I don't know where, but I guess I saw it in LinkedIn somewhere, uh, about some senior manager in a Fortune 500 company who was saying, uh, and it was ex exasperated, um, I'm managing empty chairs. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Stephen, how do you be a better manager when you, there's nobody there to manage? First of all, <laughs> Diane's absolutely correct to take the word control out of your vocabulary. I mean, you, you can't. You know, first of all, you, you talk about managing people. I don't know anybody who goes to work and wants to be managed. They want to be led. They want to be coached. They want to be mentored. Um, very few people want, you know, go to work and say, God, I can't wait to be managed today. I mean, it, um, <laughs> give me my uh, list. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I did the same thing when I was in marketing at Citibank. I mean, back in those days, this is when CRM was just becoming popular and people call it customer relationship management. And I said, uh uh, no customer wants that relationship managed. So I turned it around on its head and said it should be customer retention. Uh, marketing. So you, how do you keep your customers? And then we built a whole customer loyalty program at Citibank and then later at MasterCard for that. But that's, I'm off on a tangent as, as us marketing people can do. <laughs> um, but I tell you, I'll tell you though, there was a great story about a chair. So the, the guy who's managing chairs should, should do what Jeff Bezos did. Jeff Bezos, when he started Amazon. This, 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 <laughs> Take the chairs out. <laughs> no, no, no. Bezos <laughs> he did just the opposite, Ed. He, for, when he started the company for and he had, had senior people there. He had one empty chair at the front of the room. And he said, this chair represents our customer. Everything we think Ooh, about, yeah. everything we talk about in this meeting has to benefit that chair, has to benefit our customers. And that's when they, that's how they started coming up with ideas like, uh, you know, you could store your credit card data at Amazon and just the one click buy. They came up with that idea because how convenient is that for the customer? And this is in the days when everyone co was concerned about credit card data being stolen and you can't store information. He says, some customers will do that because some customers want the convenience of, what, of the one click. And boy, did their business take off from that. So that's, that's how I'd answer the question to the manager or the person says, I'm managing empty chairs. And, um, good, he's for like, him. Person, yeah. good for him to do something so creative. Exactly. And, so, and that's learning to give people tools and I, I'm, I got more toys on here, but they're not, you, you know, people look, Oh, what's, what's in your toy chest. Your future is in my toy chest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. And, and you, and you talk about that, talk about, you know, not only is that creative, but inspiration is because, you know, you, you, you don't come with great ideas just by trying to tweak something. You, you have to have, a, what's your purpose? What's your vision? What, what's your, my, the inspiration there was how are we going to create a customer base? What are we going to do that's going to benefit our customers? And now, now you can get inspired and start brainstorming and getting creative ideas and testing stuff. I mean, look how many things Amazon has failed at over the years. Look how many things Google has failed at over the years. Um, yet they keep growing and growing. They learn from those, uh, those so-called failures as you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, when you when you work with groups and, and, and getting back to the, you know, the, the concept of creativity is and I talk about this in my book, it doesn't matter 
what business sector you're in or where you are. It's giving people permission to play. Exactly. And Stephen, if I'm in a in, in a, if I'm in a safe environment, safe and secure from the point of that, I trust that my idea is not going to be um, rejected or 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 ridiculed. Ridiculed, right? yeah. Um, which I think, you know, not, I think I know that exists in business and that of course, we, you know, that's your expertise too, which the uncertainty of the manager, mm-hmm. the uncertainty of a leader. And so what I'm, you know, what I'm carving out is, and I, I know some companies have started this, but do you have someone on your team who is that creative catalyst? who is going to go in, not from necessarily from your industry. <laughs> I don't need to be in tech. Absolutely. I don't need to be in aviation. In fact, sometimes you look at, look at what the, the toy companies did years ago. Bring in a six-year-old. Bring in oh. a seven-year-old. Tell me what you want to <laughs> do, right? Exactly. And, they, and they did that. And, I, and again, that's what I tell people is it doesn't matter. Give me the situation. I have enough faith in myself. And, and Ed, that goes back to that word inspire. You know, I remember years ago speaking on a, and, 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 and talking about inspiration. And I said to people, you know, think about this, let's just physically look at the word inspire, like inside and spire is the top, right? So when you think of inspiration, inspiration comes from the top. Now, if you're courageous enough to, to, and I say courageous enough to believe that, you know what, what you always say, oh, we call it intuition. Oh, what is that little, you know, what do you, what is inside of you telling you that inspiration is the create, is the, is that feeling to take creative, creative action. That's what the correlation is. Just be careful, please, Diane, because don't tell people to hire people internally because us consultants would lose all our No, I'm not. No, no, no. That's, that's why they mean, bring us in. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not saying that at all. I think it's better to hire an outside. I just meant Absolutely. the word inspire. When I say in, I mean inside your heart, inside no. your soul. I don't mean inside the four walls of no. the business. I mean, okay. I mean, like your heart. Yeah. What's inside okay. that little Great. voice inside of you? Yeah, that's what I meant. No, and if they can, need us, Stephen. People yeah, need us. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and part of that, though, it goes, in honesty, it's not that we're smarter than anybody else, but it, we, we do have that confidence factor. And the other thing is, is but because we're not afraid of, we don't have that worry about job security or not getting promotion if we throw out that. I've thrown out the weirdest ideas in meetings like that because I'm not afraid to just to see how people react to it and stimulate the thinking. Um, because the worst can happen to me is I, you know, I lose my contract. I go find another client. That's, you lose your contract, but the best thing that can happen is that, and 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 I think that is the, is not the purpose of a consultant is to bring somebody in, who doesn't have any um, other agenda, exactly. but to do the work. All right, and to help people. I mean, that's all. That's my that's my focus always. Is I'm coming in here. I don't care if it's, you know, Mary, John, Sue, whoever it is. Uh, you, and just what you brought up, Stephen, is it, you don't just jump in, right? You do a series of pre-qualifying work and the objectives and the goals and, and what I call the hidden <laughs> triggers. You know, give me the closed door reason, Ed Cohen, why you want this meeting to happen. Like what is really going to benefit you and what is your long-term vision? There's always that that's never on the table. There's that. So I, there's listening to what people. Sorry, I interrupted you. There, no, no, no. Listening, listening to what's not being said, also, by because that that will give you the clues as to where those uh, those hidden agendas are. Right, and I think <laughs> you know, and I and having a topic like inspiration, creativity, it scares a lot of people. Um, but let's rephrase it. Okay, I'd like you to. I'd like to come in and help you with some innovative thinking to what's next on your marketing plan, something that will fit into that terminology, which I will defer to you, Stephen, to help me with that, because that's what, you know, you're the expert in, right? 
Oh, well, thank you for that. Uh, Ed, if I could, I'd like to change direction if I might, because yeah. um, I was on Diane's website. I'm really curious. So I have two questions. One, could you tell me more about your creative circle? And, and then secondly, is it applicable to women around the world or is this just a North American initiative, this mastermind group as I read about it? So oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. So I, I started the creative circle forum last November um, for women in meetings, incentives, conferences, all the mice, what they call the mice industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's actually, uh, yes, it's open globally. I have, uh, I have uh, one woman in Malaysia who's on the calls every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do a lot of um, personal work. We do personal development. We read from, um, are you familiar with the science of getting rich? No. no. So this book was written in 1919 and it is as applicable today as it is as it was then um it's the precursor to think and grow rich napoleon okay. hills work. okay yeah i know that one yeah so we so what i focused on with this group is is you know we read we've created a and we're growing as a as a mastermind where people have a a forum to to be who they are uh, and I, I am also in a, another one on a Friday, but to get back to the creative circle is after eight or nine months, the women are say, oh, I get it. I get what creativity is. That's why Maslow put creativity as number three from mm-hmm. the top on the hierarchy chart to be a whole person, to be inspired, to take that confidence, to take that, um, yeah, that, that trust and know that I may not understand things, but I'm going to take action. So, so this is focused on women, but yes, it is open globally. Great. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. And Thank I'm you. actually starting a second level in the next month. So that's part of my big plan that I'm working on now. I have ex- more senior executive women who are interested in this okay. uh, forum. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm blown away here. So much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephen, what else? <laughs> what else? I will say we talk about inspiration, creativity, imagination. Um, the um, okay, okay, let's let's just have some fun then. Okay, so Diane, I'm a CEO or I'm a head of a big department, major Fortune 500 company, and I call you up and I say, Diane, I'm getting eight percent employee attrition right now. The great resignation's hitting me in the head. I mean, I'm losing people left, right, and center. How can you, how can a workshop on creativity help me solve my, my employee attrition problem over to you? All right. So uh, roll up our sleeves. We're going to get to work, right? So first I'd start asking a series of questions is what is the company offering now to employees? Tell me what your, tell me what your employee benefits are. Tell me what the culture is like. Um, I would want to speak to the person more and get to know what, he or she is like in terms of a leader, um, mm-hmm. in terms of, of how they managed and really ask the question. So how do you think you're doing, Stephen? How am I doing? I, yeah. I'm, I'm a great leader, but all yeah, these people of course. are leaving. It's not my fault. They're leaving this no, company of course policy. Not. It's, not, of course, it's never, never my fault. <laughs> never your fault. Of course, we all know that. Never your fault. Okay. But but what do you think is one of the, the reasons there? And are, are you asking them People, you know, people don't even do exit interviews anymore. Remember those? That's crazy. That's crazy. You know, people don't even do that anymore. And, and that to me is insane. I know three, three to four personal friends who said <laughs> no one even asked why I was leaving. So I think we can start with the basics to try to find that out. And then maybe I would ask for 10 employees to speak to, five to 10 employees to speak with, to get their opinions on why their colleagues were leaving why they think people were leaving. So I think you start gathering information like that. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and I'm moving fast through this, but then, then the next step would be to fill out, I have a couple of very simple um, talking point pages to fill out. I don't keep them complicated because I'm not a complicated person. <laughs> um, and because my goal is to get people in a room and in a space to talk to one another. Yeah. So before you get to that, what can we do next? It's like, well, what needs to be fixed? 
and what or okay. changed. I, I got something to add to this, I think. <laughs> but uh, so tell me if I'm off. But um, isn't it so, Stephen, that it's uh, a fact that uh, people leave their direct manager uh, rather than the company? They like I the company or they think they like the CEO, but they can't stand this uh, person. Yeah. And, and so they... That's the real reason. So why not as a CEO or a big leader of a, an organization that's having this issue, why not say the issue is in lower level and there's, cause up here at sea level, we know what we want and we're motivated and we're smart. And we think about things. And then in between me and this woman or this guy or whatever, um, there's managers and that's where the problem is. I think historically that's been very true, Ed, and it probably still remains a factor today, but I think what's happening right now, we've had 11 million people quit their jobs over you know, in the three month period of, I think it was April, May, and June. Um, and we're, we're talking here in September now. So, um, but I think now people are leaving organizations partly because of policies. People, you know, decide that you know, working from home suits me. I, 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 if you make me come back to work, uh, I'm not going to do it. I, I had dinner last night here in Mexico with a, with a gentleman. We, we interviewed him recently, Paco Partida. And he says now that he, he's hired 200 people in the last five months. But the number one thing he says, these are IT people, they say their first question is, can I work from home? And if I can't, I don't even want to talk to you. So right now, I think people are leaving organizations because of policies and because of procedures and, and coming out of the pandemic. But I absolutely, I think people still leave managers too. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Interestingly, um, I was reading Steve Cadigan's book. You know, We had Steve on the show recently in his book, uh, Workquake. He makes a very interesting point that, that maybe we shouldn't worry too much about attrition uh, because this is how you build your networks. Now, I think that might work in Silicon Valley. It might work in the oil and gas industry, for instance, down in the Houston area. Because, um, you, know, you know, if I leave, let's say Steve worked for LinkedIn, you leave LinkedIn, you go work for Electronic Arts, and then you go work for Apple. You know, after nine years, or you know, say three years at each company, now you've got networks in three major organizations, which can be very beneficial personally as well as for the organization that you're working for. So I'm not sure attrition is always that bad. And that was that's a light bulb moment, Diane. When I read his book, I went, "Wow!" Because I always thought, you know, attrition's terrible. Um, employee attrition. Well, maybe there can be some benefits from that. Well, this is what comes to me with that. It too is, um, you know. You're, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think, again, I think it's part of a super big picture of the evolution of where we're going. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of, think of, you know, um, think of back in, you know, a hundred and some odd years ago, or just think before the printing press or think before, you know, uh, it's not too long ago that automation didn't come in and, and people lost their jobs, but then some people took courses on how to build the Model T Ford. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was a clip on on the news or something uh, on this topic uh, a couple of weeks ago on one of whichever network, and they interviewed um, they interviewed a, 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 a father, father of two, this not probably thirty something, used to work as a waiter and and in a food service, okay, which is su suffering the hardest hit in in many of the service categories, right? And he said he said, you know, I don't want to go back to my job, being home and having the, the support, um, I was able to take a cybersecurity course online. And now I'm furthering my education on that. And that's the field I want to go into. Well, that's what's hot and coming and restaurants are going through their change. I'm sorry for all the restaurant business. But one, again, it, are we being forced on a very big picture of this is what's next and this is what needs attention new jobs and, and new fields that don't even exist by the way right the jobs haven't even been created because the need hasn't been there yet and this is this is how we used to do it but that's not going to work anymore and so i think there's a little bit of that as well as 
listen, gets back to you, Stephen, for and Ed, first questions is about um, how do you get people to change? How do you get people to think creatively? All right. 99% of the people in the room are not going to raise their hand and say, I want disruption. I want change. Get me out of my comfort zone. I'm ready. I love it. I mean, the man in my life is golf. He's off golfing now with the same guys at the same course, the same format for 30 years. Is that going to change? Probably not in my lifetime. All right. Um, people don't want to. So when they don't want to, the universe says, I got plans for you. In 20 years, I want to send people to Mars like it's routine going to California. And I can't do that if you sit on your you know what. So we're going to spark you to change. So that's where the Diane Debit, you know, philosophy comes in of uh, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But be prepared for the ride. Be prepared. Yeah. That's a great line. Be prepared for the ride. Maybe we should end this right now. Come back for more. <laughs> there's your brand, Diane. I just <laughs> wrote it down. <laughs> instead, of, instead, of, instead of just do it, just be prepared for the ride. I just wrote it down. There you yeah. go. All there right. So Diane Devitt.com. <laughs> and Stephen Howard, the Caliente Leadership. And uh, thank you both for making my show easy. <laughs> <laughs> Great discussion. Thank you, Diane. Well, thank you both. I appreciate the, the forum. I appreciate the opportunity. And um, it's great to meet you, Stephen. Let's have a, a conversation, huh? We will do so. I'll reach right. out to you. All right. All right. Take much. care, guys. Thank and you. Come back on Global I, TV. I'll be back. Thank you. Thank Ciao. You. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day, and stay safe.